Hello, everyone, and welcome to lecture 16 of GPU computing. Uh, today, we're going to talk about sparse matrix computation. Uh, and in fact, we're going to have uh, two parts uh, of uh, this uh, of this uh, like uh, of this uh, topic. Today, we're going to look at two uh, two particular storage formats when computing sparse matrices, COO and CSR. And next time, we're going to look at other formats that allow us uh, to do other things. Uh, so what we will look at today, uh, like I said, the parallel pattern we're looking at is sparse matrix computation. Uh, now, there are a lot of different things that we do with sparse matrices. Uh, what we will be focusing on to showcase some of the challenges that we face when we do sparse matrix computations, uh, we'll be focusing on one uh, case study, which is sparse matrix vector multiplication, or SPMV. Uh, there's all kinds of other things we do with sparse matrices, uh, but we don't have, you know, we can spend a whole course on that, but we don't have enough time for that. So we'll only be doing two lectures on sparse matrix, uh, uh, sparse matrix computations, and during these two lectures, we'll be focusing on sparse matrix vector multiplication as our case study. Uh, we'll also be looking at multiple storage formats, and I'll explain what those are later on. Uh, but today, we're going to focus on two storage formats: the coordinate format, or COO, uh, and the compressed sparse row format, or CSR. Uh, and uh, and next time, we will look at two other formats uh, in which. Uh, we will uh, we will we will kind of uh, see how we can uh, you know what other how the the choice of storage format impacts how we process sparse matrices. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, before I you know talk about formats and SPMV, let's first talk about what is a sparse matrix. Now, a dense matrix is a matrix where the majority of the elements in the matrix are non-zero, and here I'm using blue. Uh, to indicate that some uh, some element has a value, a non-zero value there. So we say that a matrix is dense when the majority of the elements in that matrix are non-zero. In contrast, we say that a matrix is sparse when many of the elements in the matrix are zero. Okay, so if a matrix has many different zeros, many zeros inside of it, uh, then uh, we say this matrix is sparse. And it turns out that a lot of real world systems are actually sparse. A lot of the matrices that we use whenever we're doing all kinds of computations uh, turn out to actually be sparse and they turn out to actually be very sparse. So the vast majority of elements in a lot of matrices that we use out there are actually zeros. Uh, and the fact that these matrices are zeros means that when we do things with these matrices, like multiply them, with vectors or multiply them with other matrices, uh, we can take advantage of the fact that we have all these zeros uh, to save on multiple things. So what are the things we can save on when we take advantage of the fact that the matrix has many zeros? Well, there's several opportunities. First, we can save memory, okay? Because if a matrix has a lot of zeros, okay, we don't need to, we can, we can, save memory by compressing the matrix such that we only store the non-zero values and we don't store the zero values. So we don't need to allocate space for the zeros and this allows us to save memory, okay? Or even storage, if we're storing the matrix in a file, we can save storage, okay? Now, when we, when we don't store these zeros uh, anywhere and we save memory, there's also a, a kind of a, uh, an effect of that, and the effect of that is that when we uh, compute with this matrix, the fact that we don't store these zeros means we don't need to load the, these zeros when we are computing, and this helps us save memory bandwidth, and it also means we don't need to compute with these zeros, which also saves computation time. So when I take a matrix and multiply it with a vector, another vector or another matrix, Okay, I have to go through all these non-zeros and process them when I'm doing the matrix vector or the matrix matrix multiplication. But when I when my matrix has a whole bunch of zeros inside of it, not only do I not need to store these zeros, which helps me save memory, I also don't need to load and compute with these zeros, which saves uh, the memory bandwidth and the computation time. Okay. Uh, so when we look at sparse matrices, we spend a lot of time thinking about how can we represent sparse matrices in a way 
that allows me to save memory and also allows me to avoid loading and computing with zero values. Uh, so a lot of the work on sparse matrices uh, has to deal has to deal with what uh, how to design different storage formats for these sparse matrices. So there's actually many storage formats for, for sparse matrices out there. What we will do is we will focus on four different storage formats uh, in 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 the in the next uh, in this lecture and the next lecture. Uh, and again, you can you can go into all kinds of other formats that allow you to optimize for all kinds of different things. But we will focus on these four because they're sufficient to kind of demonstrate all the concepts that we would like to demonstrate in an introduction to this kind of topic. Uh, so one format is the coordinate format. Another format is the compressed sparse row format. And these are the two formats we'll focus on today. Uh, another format is the LPAP format, uh, and, you know, and the abbreviation for that is ELL. Uh, coordinate format abbreviation is COO. And the compressed sparse row format is uh, uh, CSR. Uh, and then uh, there's also the jagged diagonal format, which is also uh, JDS. Uh, and there is there are uh, there are many uh, many other formats uh, again out there. Uh, there's still research on you know people still do research on different formats for representing sparse matrices depending on uh, depending on uh, you know what their their specific application is. Uh, somebody's asking how recent are these? Uh, these are you know these these have been around for quite a while. Uh, the reason we look at them is they're kind of the classics and uh, and. Uh, uh, in particular for GPU, they allow us to emphasize different things. Uh, a lot of the other formats are kind of squeezing more and more benefit out of some uh, out of out of these formats, but they rely on kind of similar principles. So yes, these formats are commonly used, and there are other formats that are also used. Um, but but hopefully by covering these formats, uh, it allow you can easily go and read up on another format, and understand uh, why why they made the decisions that they made. So thank you for that question. Uh, okay, so different design. The reason we have different formats is because, as you can expect, different formats are good at different things. Uh, so there's various considerations that go into designing a storage format for sparse matrices. One of them is space efficiency. Okay, uh, how you know how efficient, uh, how how you know how much memory do I save when I use this format? Okay. Another one is flexibility, uh, and particularly here, I mean the flexibility in terms of modifying uh, the the matrix. Okay, so some may, some formats make it easier to add, reorder, or remove values than other formats. Okay, so if I plan to kind of modify my matrix a lot, I might choose a different format from if I'm planning to just keep my matrix fixed the whole time. My matrix is constant throughout my computation. Another one is accessibility, so the ease of finding the desired data. So when you when you access a matrix, uh, you want to access it in a particular way. Maybe you want to go through all the rows of the matrix, or maybe you want to go through all the columns of the matrix. Okay, depending on how you would like to access your matrix, different formats might make certain types of accesses easier than others. Uh, yet another one is the memory access pattern that the storage format enables, right? And in the context of GPUs, it's whether this storage format enables memory coalescing. Okay, so does so the choice of storage format may impact, you know, how you, you know, how you how you lay out your data impacts how you access your data, the memory access pattern. So you can design formats that are designed that you know give you better coalescing. And then finally, load balance, and the load balance means how much work each uh, each you know parallel worker has. And in the context of GPUs, this translates into control divergence. Okay, so how how much does your format allow you to minimize control divergence? Okay, so these are the different considerations that go into uh, designing uh, sparse matrix storage formats. And by the way, some of these are kind of general. So space efficiency is, you know, a general concept, but some of these are specific to a certain application, right? So, uh, uh, so the memory access pattern, the load balance. Well, when we talk about these, we, we talk about them in the context of a specific application. How these formats allow a specific application to have coalesced accesses. How these formats 
uh, allow a specific application to minimize its control divergence. And for this reason, uh, when we talk about these formats, we're going to talk about them in the context of a specific application, and that's SPMV or sparse matrix vector multiplication. So the choice of the best format depends on the computation. Okay. Uh, we will use sparse matrix vector multiplication or SPMV as an example to study the different formats. So in this in these, in this lecture and the next lecture, we'll be looking at sparse matrix vector multiplication, which is where you take a sparse matrix and a dense vector, okay, and you produce a dense vector. This is what we will be looking at now and next time, okay? However, there's all kinds of other sparse matrix uh, computations that you might want to do. Maybe you're doing sparse matrix with a sparse vector, or maybe you're doing a sparse matrix with a dense matrix, or maybe you're doing a sparse matrix with another sparse sparse matrix. And there's a whole bunch of computations you can do with sparse matrices. Uh, and of course, the storage, different storage formats may be good for different computations. Okay, but we will use this particular computation as a case study just to showcase some of the challenges that go into uh, dealing with sparse matrix computations. Okay. Okay, so let's start with the COO format. Uh, the COO format uh, is as follows. Let's say I had this matrix over here, the sparse matrix. I have these white squares are represent zero values, and the non-white squares represent non-zero values. Okay, I'm using integers for simplicity, but obviously this matrix could have floating points, it could have doubles, it could have all kinds of uh, uh, data types. Now, the way that the coordinate format works is that we're going to store every non-zero along with its row index and its column index, okay? So what we do is we take these values, these non-zero values in our matrix, we're gonna put those in an array, you know, one after the other. So we have one, we have seven, we have five, we have three, right? We have nine, okay? And we put all the, the elements one after the other. And then for each element, we're gonna have a, a row array and a column array that tell us for each element what the corresponding row and column index are. Okay. So what this does is it says that row the value one is at row zero and column zero. So here the value one here is at row zero and column zero. The value two, for example, is at row two and column one. So here when we go to the value two, we find that the value two is at, at the row two and column. One. Okay, clear. Questions about this format? Someone's asking, is this similar to how we represent uh, uh, graphs? And yes, it is. It is similar to how we represent graphs. And in fact, after our two lectures on uh, sparse matrices, we're actually going to have another two lectures on uh, graphs. That's why I told you that you guys will be, uh, will be quite uh, accustomed to these formats by the time we finish uh, the sparse matrix and graph lectures uh, in this course. Doctor? Okay. Yes. Uh, when you say uh, the matrix or whatever is in this format, uh, do we have to, as a programmer, change our our uh, data data that is stored in memory, uh, change it to this format, or we, do we assume that our data is already this way? Like in in practice, how is it done? I mean, you could have libraries that will, where, you know, you give them a dense matrix, uh, and then it's part they sparsify them for you, or they read some sparse matrix from a file and they provide them for you. But otherwise, you can also implement such a library yourself. Okay, so who converted the matrix to this format? Whether it was you or whether it's uh, some library that you called is, you know, it's a detail. You know, we don't care about that. But what we care about is what this format, you know, how this format works and how we can use it uh, to. Uh, perform different uh, kinds of sparse matrix computations. Uh, professor, depending on how sparse your matrix is, you could end up having more data in your COO than uh, the original matrix. Right, so if your matrix, uh, you know, this matrix here is quite dense, okay, just because I have, you know, I, I can only fit such, uh, you know, I cannot fit a huge matrix on this slide. Uh, so you're right that, you know, in the, uh, with a matrix this dense, you probably end up need more space to store the the sparse matrix representation than you need to store the matrix the matrix of the dense matrix itself. However, you know it, when this matrix is thousands by thousands, 
uh, then you could you could easily see how you quickly end up in a, you quickly end up saving a lot of memory when you use the sparse matrix format. So yeah, good observation. You know, if your matrix is this dense, right, you probably don't want to make it you, make it sparse. If your matrix is 50% dense or even 20% dense or even 10% dense in some cases, you probably don't want to sparsify it. But sparse matrices in practice can be very sparse. We're looking at less than 1% of the elements are are uh, are zeros, are, are non zeros. Okay, so uh, uh, so having seen the COO format, now the question is, uh, or let's take a look at how we can use the COO format uh, to perform SPMV or sparse matrix vector multiplication. So let's say I have this sparse matrix, and what I would like to do is I would like to multiply this sparse matrix by this dense vector to produce this dense vector. Okay, and the question is. How can I, you know, if I want to do this in series, it's easy, right? I just go through the, you know, I can go through each element and multiply by the corresponding input value to get and, and you know, update the corresponding output value. But if I want to do this in parallel, how can I do it? The way we did it before, no? Well, we haven't done sparse matrix vector multiplication before. We didn't even do dense matrix vector. We did dense matrix matrix. How do how we, can we do sparse? Go ahead. Sorry, we have to put the threads on the value matrix. You mean assign a thread to each one of these values? And the value uh, and the value uh, value array uh, that below. You want to assign a thread to every what? Uh, the value. Array uh, uh, we, 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 we take which row and which column and uh, we we add the, the sums in the output uh, array and the output vector. Because we can do it the way we did it before in matrix matrix multiplication where we assigned a thread for each output uh, element of the matrix because right. Okay, wh so why so why can't we do it? Why can't we assign a thread to each output value, for example? I would argue we should, because some non-zero elements can now be, uh, like, uh, z non some zero elements could not, can now be non-zero. Okay. So th these are actually two, two very possible uh, approaches to parallelizing this. We can assign a thread to every output value, okay, and have that thread to compute and uh, multiply the row uh, with the with the input vector to get the output value, or we can assign a thread to every non-zero value in the matrix and have that thread, okay, uh, find the input that corresponds to that non-zero value. So in this case, it would be this, and then do the multiplication and update the corresponding output value. So both of these are are are, are possible ways of parallelizing it. What way seems most suitable for the COO format? One so thread. let's say, let's let's say for example that I assign a thread to every output element in, in this format, and that thread wanted to go through the corresponding input row and do a do a uh, uh, you know and do and calculate the value of the output. What would I what would that thread need to do? It would need to search for the row vector for its corresponding. Uh... Uh, sub sub vector. Uh, right. This so if I might take a, thread, a little bit of time. Right. Exactly. So if I assign a thread here to row zero, for example, so if I assign it to output element zero, this thread needs to go through the non zeros in row zero and multiply them with the corresponding the elements in the input vector. So the thread has to go and find all the non zeros in row zero. Which means it'll have to do a search through this array, right? And but here, you know, I might be lucky if the array is sorted, but the COO format doesn't really tell me this array has to be sorted. These non-zeros could be in any order. So I might actually have to do a linear search through the entire array to find the element that corresponds to the row that I'm interested in. So this is why the COO format is not really does not really make it easy for me to assign a thread to every 
uh, output element and loop through the corresponding row. And this is one of the things I meant by accessibility. Different formats make it easier to access different things. Okay, what does the COO format make make easy for me to do? Assign a thread to each non-zero vector. Right, exactly. Element. I can assign a thread to each non-zero element in the matrix. Okay, I assign a thread to each non-zero element in the matrix. So uh, the the kind of the most sensible parallelization approach is to assign a thread for every non-zero element in the matrix. Okay. And what that looks like down here is that I assign a thread to every value in the value array. Okay, so that's I think uh, somebody had mentioned that at the at the beginning, um, but I was I just wanted to uh, uh, to emphasize logically what was going on. Logically, what we're doing is we're assigning a thread to every non-zero in the matrix, right? Physically, what happens is we assign a thread to every element in the non-zero array and the values array. Okay, so we assign a thread to every element in the, we can assign a thread to every element in the matrix, and that thread, you know, can easily find its corresponding row and column index. And what, once the thread knows its row and column index, what can it do? It goes back to the row and takes uh, the corresponding uh, vector element. Right, so, uh, thread one, for example, this thread, for example, knows that it's responsible for the element at row zero and column zero. So it finds the input value at the corresponding row and then goes and updates the, the output value at the corresponding column. Uh, so to make it more clear, for example, this thread here is responsible for, uh, you know, this thread here is responsible for this non zero. So it comes, it says, oh, well, I'm responsible for the element at row two and column one. So I will load the the uh, input value corresponding to my column index. So I'll load the input value corresponding to uh, to that has the index one, which in this case is one over here. Uh, and then I will I will multiply that with my non-zero, and then I will store the result uh, at the index of the corresponding row. Okay. Now the problem with this approach is that. Uh, I can have multiple threads updating the same. Uh, uh, the threads that are positive non zeros in the same row will end up updating the same output value. Okay, so what I will need is I will need to, since I have multiple threads that are writing to the same output value, I will need something like atomic operation. Okay, so this is, uh, if I use the COO format, uh, this is uh, how I would have to implement SPMV. I would assign a thread to every non-zero. Uh, every thread will be responsible for one element. Okay, it'll it'll get the corresponding uh, it'll get the corresponding uh, value. Uh, it'll get the input value corresponding to its column index, and then it'll store uh, at the output value corresponding to its row index. Okay, let's implement this. Uh, and, and because we have multiple threads uh, writing to the same output value, we'll do atomic operation. Let's go and implement this and see. Uh, how it works. So I'm going to switch to the, my code over here. Here I've set up the code to where I have a matrix in the COO format. I, uh, I, you know, I allocate copy to the GPU, uh, and then I call, uh, I call uh, the GPU kernel, and the number of threads I give it corresponds to the number of non-zeros in the matrix. Uh, and then I copy back the output vector and I free free the uh, the data. So let's go and uh, work on the code itself. So I have my COO matrix, okay, and I have my input vector, and I have my output vector. So first thing is uh, each thread is going to be assigned to a different non-zero element. So the thread first needs to figure out the index of the non-zero element in these arrays that it's responsible for. Okay, so I, I will uh, find the global index of the thread. I'll write unsigned int i is equal to Block index dot x times block dim dot x plus thread index dot x. Okay, uh, so i over here is going to be the index of the non-zero element. Okay, so it's going to be the index that I will use to index the value array, the column array, and the row array. Okay, now one thing I need to make sure of is I need to make sure that I am within bounds. So what what does what do I have 
how could I be out of bounds? What do I need to compare I to to make sure that it's within bounds? Well, I need to make sure that my I don't have any threads out here. I need to make sure that I is less than the total number of non-zeros in the matrix. All right. If I is less than uh, the total number of non-zeros, so I the COO matrix has a field uh, over here which is num uh, non-zeros. Okay. So now that I've done my boundary check, now I know that the thread process is a valid non-zero. So now I can uh, now now I can uh, process uh, the element at that thread. So what do I need to do for each element? Well, I have to find its row. I have to load its row index. I'm gonna have to find its column. I'm gonna have to load its column index. I'm gonna have to find its value. So I load the the the, the value from here. And then I'm gonna need to get the element that corresponds to the column index from the input vector, multiply, and then add the result to the element at the corresponding, uh, uh, the output vector at the corresponding row index. Okay. Find the row. So the row is going to be uh, in the row array of the COO representation. So I'm going to uh, get my COO matrix, and in my COO matrix, I'm going to I'm going to have a row indexes uh, field, okay? And this row indexes field is indexed by what? It's going to be indexed by i, okay? Because i is the index of the non-zero, okay? Similarly, I'm going to get my column value. So my COO matrix is also going to have a, a field called all indexes, okay? Uh, and this field is going to be all, is also going to be indexed with i to get the corresponding uh, column index, okay? And I'm also going to load the value. So the value is a floating point number. So I'm going to load the value, and the value is also going to be at co matrix dot values, and I will uh, access it with uh, the element i. So now I have uh, the row and the column and the value that the thread is responsible. Now, what do I need to do? Well, I need to multiply the value with the input element at, at the column index and add it to the output element at the row index. Okay. What I'm going to do is I want to do out vector of row and I want to add to it in vector of column times the value. This is what I would like to do. Now, what's the problem if I just do it this way? Race condition. Right, I have a race condition. So what can I do to avoid the race condition? Atomic add. Right, uh, atomic add. So instead of doing this, I will do atomic add. I'll give it the address of the value I'm adding to. And I will give it the value that I would like to have. Okay, so this uh, is a COO. Uh, this is how we would implement sparse matrix vector multiplication in COO. All right, clear. Any questions? By the way, I apologize. I should have shown you the the how I the, the representation before we implemented this. So here, this shows you how the CO matrix is represented. I have num rows, num columns, num non zeros, row index, column index, and the values. So these are the different fields that I need in the COO matrix. Okay. All right, let's compile this and run it and verify that it works. So we're going to compile, and then we're going to run, and indeed uh, it works. And as you can see, we get uh, we get around four times speed up. Uh, in the kernel. This is also a, a, a relatively small matrix that I'm using. So the smaller the matrix, the less speed up you'll get, but still four times is, is substantial. Of course, if you include all the copy time, right, the, the GPU is not doing very well, um, uh, but that's because, again, it's a small matrix. Um, and then also, uh, um, also, you know, if uh, because sparse matrix vector multiplication has low data reuse, uh, you can expect that the GPU performance is not going to be as substantial uh, as uh, if you have something that has a lot of data reads. Uh, okay, 
so uh, what are the what are what what's what's we already talked about what's bad in doing sparse matrix multiplication this way? We have these atomic operations, but what's good about doing it this way? We only do the number of necessary operations, like we ignore all the non zeros since the format is. Okay, so sure, we're we're only going to uh, load kind of, kind of do it over necessary operations. Actually, in most formats, the we we do the only necessary operations. In some cases, we uh, we might you know we might have to store some of the zeros um, and do some unnecessary operations, but in, in most cases, uh, we we don't. How's our memory access pattern here to the to the matrix? It's coalesced. Right. Every thread is uh, when we access the value array, when we access the column array, when we access the row array, our accesses are all going to be coalesced. Okay. So we actually have good coalescing behavior for the matrix. Okay. Of course, the vectors are not going to be as coalesced. The, the input vector is not going to be as coalesced. And the output vector is we're using atomic operations. Okay. But at least when we access the matrix, the accesses are coalesced. So this is the code that we wrote. Uh, so uh, I'm going to talk about various uh, advantages of uh, of doing this, but first let me kind of show you how we can see the access are coalesced. So here, i is the is corresponds to the thread index. So every consecutive thread has a consecutive i value, and you can see how when we're accessing a row index and our column index and our values, uh, we have uh, we have nice coalescing behavior. Okay. Any questions about the code? Okay, so let's talk about the trade-offs of the COO format. So that, first of all, uh, we, we you know we mentioned some advantages and disadvantages. Let's kind of recap them. So first, the advantages of the storage formats. Remember, we talked about um, you know different uh, metrics by which we talk about advantages and disadvantages. One of them was space efficiency. Another one was the flexibility, how easy it is to add and remove elements from the format. Another one. Uh, was accessibility. What does the format make it easy for you to access? Another one was coalescing, and another one was control divergence. Okay, so for the COO format, okay, what uh, what does uh, how does the COO format uh, do in terms of flexibility, easy of adding and removing elements? Well, if we go back, we're looking at uh, the the storage format itself. Uh, uh, here, I can easily kind of reorder the elements. I can easily, if I want to add elements, it's quite easy because I can just add stuff at the end of this array. Okay, so the COO format actually makes it easy for me to add elements. Removing elements is a little bit more difficult because if I want to remove and I want to shift everything, that's quite expensive. Uh, but sometimes if you remove, you can just replace this with some kind of uh, uh, kind of sentinel value that tells you that, okay, this value here is not valid. Uh, but the COO format makes it easy for me to to add elements, okay, so it gives me that flexibility. Uh, what about accessibility? What does the, the CO format make it make easy for me to access? If we go back and look at uh, this over here, what does the CO format make easy for me to access? The rows and the columns of the non-zero elements. Right, so given a non-zero element, it's easy for me to find the row and the column for that non-zero element. The COO format makes it easy for me to find the row and the column of a specific non-zero element, which makes it easy for me to parallelize across non-zero elements. Because if I assign a thread to every non-zero element, then I can easily go and find its row and column. So that's that's accessibility. Uh, what about uh, memory coalescing? So how does it do on memory coalescing? Like we said, the accesses are nice and coalesced. What about control divergence? How does S S COO with SPMV do on control divergence? Does not have control divergence. Right, there's no control divergence because every thread does the same amount of work. Every thread processes one non-zero value. Okay, so so if we if 
we go and talk about the, uh, the advantages of COO, we saw that we have the flexibility. Uh, uh, it has good flexibility because we can easily add new elements. Okay, and also the non-zeros can be stored in any order. Uh, in terms of accessibility, it makes given a non-zero, it makes it easy for us to find the row and the column. So this allows us to easily parallelize across non-zeros. Uh, we also see that SPMV COO has coalesced memory accesses to the matrix. And we also have that SPMV COO does not have control of divergence. Okay, what about the disadvantages? What were the disadvantages of uh, the COO format? What did the COO format make hard for us to do? Accessing uh, and using the coordinates. Right, exactly. Not to do so, search. Right, exactly. So we said that if you want to go through the all the elements of a single row, right? When we came, we said, "Hey, you know, why don't we try to parallelize? Oops, why don't we try to parallelize uh, by assigning a thread to every output element and having that thread compute the input rows?" Well, we weren't able to do that because it's not easy for us to find all the uh, all the non-zeros for a particular row. So if we uh, if we look at uh, accessibility. Uh, given a row or a column, it's hard for us to find all the non-zeros. We need to perform a search. Okay, and the other disadvantage is that we have, because we cannot do this, we have to use atomic operations. So these are some of the advantages and disadvantages of COO. So to address the disadvantages here, to avoid doing atomic operations, to be able to assign a thread to every output element and go through the corresponding row values, uh, there's another format, which is the compressed sparse row format. Uh, so if I have my matrix, if my matrix looks like this, this is the same matrix we had before. This time, what I've done is I've colored all the elements in the same uh, row, the same color. The way the compressed sparse row format works is that we're going to store the non-zeros in the same row adjacent to each other, and we're just going to store an index to the first element of each uh, of each row. So here for our values. We're going to have the non-zeros in the first row next to each other, the non-zeros in the next row next to each other, the non-zeros in the third row next to each other, etc. For each of these values, we're going to have the corresponding column index. So here, the, uh, one is at column zero, seven is at column one, so we have zero, one. Over here, uh, five, three, and nine are at columns zero, two, and three, so that's why we have zero, two, and three over here. Uh, two and eight are at columns one and two, so we're going to have one and two over here. And then what we're going to do is we're going to store uh, for each row where the non-zeros of that row begin. Uh, so we're, we're going to call this the, the row pointers array. So we're not going to have a row index array like we had before, where for every non-zero we had the row index. And we're going to have a row pointers array uh, that's, that stores, it doesn't really store a pointer, it stores an index. It's going to store the index at which the non-zeros of each row begin. So here, the non-zeros the non -zero of the first row begin at index zero. The non-zeros of the second row begin at index two. So we store two over here. The non-zeros of the third row begin at index five. So we're going to store a five over here, et cetera. So now let's say that we wanted to use this format to implement SPMV. How would we implement SPMV with this format? One thread per row. Right, exactly. We can have one thread for every output element that loops through the row corresponding to the output element and does the computation. So we're going to assign one thread per uh, to loop over each input row sequentially and update the corresponding output element. All right. Now, well, this looks like this. Okay, we have a thread for each that starts at the first non-zero of each row. Now, if you look at what this looks like down here when we're going through our, our values array, we're going to have the first thread starting here, the second thread starting here, the third thread starting here, and then the fourth thread starting here. Now, on the next iteration, the, this, this fourth thread is done, so it's finished working. It's going to wait for the rest. The second thread you know, comes here, third thread comes here, fourth thread comes here, right? On the next, you know, they, they each go to the second non-zero element in the matrix. On the next iteration, uh, the, these, the, the first and the third thread are done. There's only the second thread remaining. 
So these guys, all these guys are done. They're waiting for this thread to finish. And this thread goes to the next element in the matrix. Uh, and then uh, we are done. Okay. So what are the advantages and disadvantages here? They have control divergence as a disadvantage. Right. So one of the advantages is that we have control divergence. Every thread has a different amount of work that it needs to do. So we have control divergence. What's another disadvantage? Memory axes are not coalesced. Right. When we're going through these this this array, the memory axes are not coalesced. What's the advantage? There's there are no atomic, atomic operations. Ends. Right. We don't have atomic operations. We can not to thread, memory, right? Sorry. I mean, we can load the for every thread. We can load to shared memory, right? What do we want to load to shared memory? I mean, the the array of the values. So how how does loading the array of values to shared memory help me? So I I don't uh, access for uh, for in every iteration I access the global memory. Is, so do I have data use such, here? Uh, do I have data use here? Uh, well, can, if if we can use uh, for every uh, thread, it can load uh, like for every thread loads one value. Instead right. of, I, instead see, of I, see, I, mean. I, I see what you're getting at. So uh, what you're saying is you want to use shared memory so that you load in a coalesced way and then access in an uncoalesced way from shared memory. Is that what you're saying? Yes, somehow. Yeah, so you can kind of do that. For very large matrices, you don't have really have a guarantee to, uh, to, um, to fit in shared memory. So that might be a challenge, okay? Also, whether whether or there's other ways to improve coalescing other than using shared memory. So we're going to use different way to improve coalescing, okay? Um, but also in, in general, shared memory is not very effective for SPMV because you uh, you don't have data reuse. So every element in the matrix is used exactly once. So yes, you can use shared memory to improve the coalescing behavior, um, but there's better ways to improve the coalescing behavior by rearranging the data. Okay, professor. Yes. Uh, is yes. there uh, also is a, as a disadvantage? Can we consider that we're not maximizing the number of threads running? Uh, that could run. Yes, eventually. you can say that. So we have less parallelism here. We have less parallelism now. Depending on how big our matrix is, that may or may not be a problem. Okay, so if, if our matrix is not that big, uh, we we have we're, we're creating fewer threads, so we're not fully utilizing the GPU. If our matrix is huge, uh, then we, we may not have a problem there. But still, we have control divergence. So some threads will finish before others, and we'll have to wait for the thread, the, the slowest threads to finish. So we will have underutilization of our uh, if our, of our GPU uh, at, uh, at some point. Okay, let's go and implement this uh, and, uh, and see how well it performs. So I'm going to uh, I'll leave my... Uh, COO implementation, and I'm going to go into uh, my CSR implementation. Uh, over here, uh, just to show you, um, I have a CSR matrix struct defined. I have num rows, num columns, number of non zeros, and I have the row pointers, the column index, and the value. Okay, when I come down, I want to, uh, I want to implement my SPMV kernel. Uh, we said, how are we going to, what are we going to assign every thread to? Each output element. So every thread is going to be assigned to a, a, an output element and the corresponding row for that output element. Uh, so the thread index is also going to be the row index. Uh, so here uh, I will write unsigned int row is equal to thread index oops, equal to thread index dot x. Oops. Thread index dot x. Oops, <laughs> excuse me. Block index.x times block dim.x 
plus thread index dot x. What what does my boundary check compare to? I'm assigning a thread to every uh, output element. What does my boundary check compare compare to to make sure my my uh, my my threads are in bounds? Size of row pointers. Right, so the, the number of rows basically. So I'm gonna uh, row pointers is actually an extra element that gives me the total number of uh, elements, so that for the last row I know where it ends. Okay, because every row pointer, the next row pointer tells me where 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 the previous row pointer ends. Hello. So then for a boundary check, we need to make sure that the thread is processing a row that is within bounds. So we will do if row is less than CSR matrix dot num rows okay uh, and then once uh, we have the thread uh, once the thread has figured out what row it's responsible for what this thread needs to do is it needs to go and it needs to find uh, the uh, the big the non zeros for that row and then it needs to go through them and loop through them one at a time stopping at uh, at the last value so how does the thread figure out uh where where to where uh, it's non-zero start well it's going to use the row pointers array okay so what i will do is each thread is going to loop through the non-zeros uh inside of its row it's going to start at row pointers of row right so thread zero We'll start at row point the value at row pointers of zero. Thread one will start at the value at row pointers of one, etc. So here the thread will start at CSR matrix dot row pointers of row. Okay. Where does it stop? So it starts here and then it loops. Where does it stop? Well, it stops at the row pointers of the next value. Right, it's going to stop at the row pointers of the next value. So here we will stop at csr.row pointers of row plus one. Okay, and this is why we need to have the for the we need to have one additional element at the end so that the very last thread knows that uh, knows where that it needs to stop. So this last element will tell me the total number of non-zeros in the matrix. It also tells me where the last thread stops. So for i is equal to CSR matrix dot row pointers of row, i is less than CSR matrix dot row pointers of row plus one plus plus i. And now what we would like to do is for each one of these values, we're going to get the column index, get the value, okay, and multiply the value with the input element at the corresponding uh, uh, column index, okay? So how do we get uh, the value at the column index? We're going to, well, let's first get the column index. We're going to get unsigned int call is equal to. Uh, we're going to use the uh, column indexes array, and we're going to index it with i, which is the, the counter in this loop that's going from uh, the beginning of the non zeros in the loop until the, till the end of the, so the beginning of the non zeros of the row, till the end of the non zeros of the row. Uh, and then we're going to write float value. Uh, we're going to get the value. The value we're going to get from the values array. So we're going to write CSR matrix dot values of i. Okay. Uh, and now what we would like to do uh, is we're going to, we want to increment the uh, value at 
um, out uh, at, the, at the, we want to implement, increment the element that we're responsible for by the non-zero times uh, the, 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 the input element of the corresponding column index. So we're going to do out vector of row plus equals the value times the in vector of column. Okay. Now, since out vector here is in global memory, uh, to uh, to avoid uh, well, first of all, since this thread is the only thread that's going to write to its out vector, since each thread owns its own element in the output vector, we don't need an atomic operation here. Okay, because every thread owns uh, its output element, and because of that, we also don't need to read and write from global memory on every iteration. We can simply initialize a counter outside the loop we can, uh, or a, an accumulator outside the loop. Okay, and then we can, uh, instead of having out vector of row here, we can increment the accumulator. Uh, and then after that, we can store uh, the accumulator at out vector of row. Okay, so this is the good for doing SVMV using the CSR, uh, the CSR format. Any questions about this? Professor, I want to ask why don't we uh, assign each uh, element a thread? Uh, why don't we assign for each uh, a thread for each element in the matrix? You mean uh, for why do I don't we assign a thread for each element in the CSR matrix? Yes. So why do we question. perform this loop for this for loop? So great question. Let's assume that we wanted to implement the previous approach which was the approach implemented with CO. Let's assume we want to implement that with CSR. So let's say I wanted, in, with the CSR format, to assign a thread for every non-zero element and make that thread responsible for, uh, for that non-zero element. Would it work with CSR? I just uh, need to keep track of the row pointers for each element in the value. So the thread, the thread, the thread give. If I assign a thread to every value here, the thread no can find out what its value is, what its column index is. But how does it know what its row is? Right. If a thread uh, with index three, for example, knows that it's responsible for this value, okay. The thread with index three happens to also be, have the value three. It knows that it's responsible for this column two. But how can it find out what its row index is? It's going to have to come and search inside of this row pointers array for which row contains uh, the, the non-zero at index three. In this case, it would be here because three is in between two and five. So it would have to do some kind of binary search inside of this row pointers array to go and figure out what its row index is. And that is why, uh, Paralyze CS, the CSR representation makes it easy to paralyze across rows or across output elements, but it doesn't make it easy to paralyze across non zeros. Because given a row, we can go and find the non zeros for that row, but given a non zero, it's hard for us to go and find the corresponding row. We have to do a search. So, this is one of the trade offs of the CSR format. And I'll talk more about more about trade offs, but let me first run the code and show you the performance. So, let's close. Uh, and we're gonna, now going to compile the CSR code, and we're going to run the CSR code. Uh, and as you can see, it actually has worse performance because of the atomics, okay, and because of the poor coalescing. Now, in this particular case, it has poor performance, okay. In other cases, uh, depending on the matrix, depending on the dimensions, uh, the CSR the CSR might have better performance than the CO. Okay, but in this particular case, uh, for this particular matrix, CSR actually performed poorer than COO with atomics, because the performance penalty that I got from having poor coalescing and poor divergence was worse than the performance penalty that I got, uh, 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 sorry, poor, poor uh, coalescing and high control divergence was worse than the performance penalty that I got from the atomic operation. Okay, clear. Any questions about that? You will notice something though. 
you'll notice that the copy time to the GPU and back, so, or, or sorry, the copy time to the GPU is lower than the copy time to the GPU for COO. Why is that? We had row before as opposed to row pointers now, which is smaller. Right, exactly. So it takes me less time to copy the CSR matrix to the GPU than it takes me to copy the CO matrix to the GPU. Okay, and the reason is that the CSR matrix does not have a row index array, it just has a row pointers array, which is much smaller. So the CSR matrix is actually more space efficient than the COO matrix. Okay. So let's go let's compare CSR and COO based on the different metrics that we talked about. So in terms of space efficiency, what what what's better, CSR or COO? CSR. CSR, right? In terms of uh, flexibility, so the ease of ease of adding elements to the matrix, which one is better? CSR or COO. Adding elements, right? CSR. COO. COO is better because with COO, I don't have an order, right? I can simply just add elements at the end of the uh, the arrays. Whereas here, if I wanted to add an element to column three or call, sorry, if I want to add an element to row, uh, row uh, this second row or the third row over here, what would I need to do? Increment all the elements after the right, row exactly. So all of the elements uh, in the same row need to be next to each other. So if I want to add an element to a particular row, I'm going to have to shift all the elements in their later rows, and I'm going to have to go and increment all the row pointers for the for the later rows. So in terms of flexibility, in terms of space efficiency, CSR is better. But in terms of flexibility, the ease of adding things, COO is actually better. Okay. Uh, what about uh, what about uh, um, uh, accessibility? What does COO make easy to access? What does CSR make easy to access? COO makes easy to access so, any, any output thread, whereas CSR makes it easy to access any input thread. Uh, no, not output. No. Well, if by input, input you mean the matrix, then, then sure. So CSR makes it easy for me to access. Given a row, it's easy to find the non-zeros of that row. So, and that makes it easy to parallelize across rows. COO makes it makes it easy to, to do the following. Given a non-zero, find the row and the column for that non-zero. So COO makes it easy to parallelize across non-zeros. Okay, so that's accessibility. What about coalescing? COO is more called a memory coalesce than right. CSR. COO has better coalescing. What about di control divergence? COO is better. Right, COO is better. And what about uh, you know synchronization, having to use atomics and things? CSR is better. CSR is better, exactly. Professor? Uh, so if, we, if we go back to our trade-offs, yes, question? Uh, for for CSR, aren't the the um, uh, the memory writes uh, coalesced? You mean the write to the uh, to the uh, output vector? Yes, they are. Oh, yes, okay. Yes, you're absolutely right. So so you're absolutely right. CSR makes coalescing the out writes to the output. Uh, CSR helps you coalesce the writes to the output. Uh, whereas with, with COO, you have to use atomics there, uh, but uh, COO makes it easier to coalesce the inputs. And since the input matrix is larger than the output vector, usually uh, that's what dominates your your uh, your memory access. And that is why um, uh, we when talking about coalescing, we've been focusing on the matrix because it's larger. Okay. So the advantages you. of uh, CSR are that it has better space efficiency. Uh, has better uh, for accessibility. It allows us, given a row, to find all the non-zeros, and then C SP and VCSR avoids atomics because every thread owns its output. But the disadvantage is that it's hard to add new elements to the matrix, and then for accessibility, given a non-zero, it's hard to find uh, a row. Given a column, it's hard to find all the non-zeros uh, for that column. Uh, and then, uh, and then SPMV uh, CSR axes are not coalesced, and SPMV CSR has control divergence. Okay. 
Uh, so one thing here to note is I kind of sneak this in here. So given a column, it's hard to find all the non-zeros for that column. Okay. So CSR, given a row, it helps me find the non-zeros in that row. But if I want to, for example, do a column traversal down a column, I cannot do that with CSR. So there's actually a transpose of CSR, which is, well, not a transpose of CSR, but kind of the, the, uh, the other version of CSR, which is compressed sparse column. And CSC is like CSR, but it groups non-zeros by column as opposed to by row. So SPMV doesn't require this, but, but if I have some other computation that, allow, that requires me to loop through the columns of a matrix, okay? In this case, CSC would put the non-zeros of the first column next to each other, followed by the non-zeros of the second column next to each other, followed by the non-zeros of the third column next to each other, et cetera. So CSC would have similar advantages and disadvantages to CSR, except for accessibility. CSC uh, makes it easy to access the non-zeros of a column given a column index, whereas CSR makes it uh, easy to access the non-zeros of a row given a row index, okay? Now, it would be nice if we go back to these trade-offs, it would be nice if we can avoid the atomics, which is what CSR gives us, but at the same time, uh, have a better memory access pattern, uh, so where our access pattern is coalesced, and also be able to reduce our control divergence. So it would be nice if we could have the best of both worlds. And for this reason, what we will, uh, this lecture will is to be continued. Okay, next time what we will do is we will look at other storage formats that allow us to improve coalescing and also reduce control divergence. In particular, we're going to look at the LPAC format or ELL which helps us improve coalescing uh, compared to CSR. And we will also look at the jagged diagonal storage format or JDS, which will help us reduce control divergence. Okay. Uh, any, any final questions before we end? Professor, do uh, yes. in all those formats, if you have a row or a column of complete zeros, can you collapse it or no? Uh, do, do they offer that or no? Well, it depends. It depends. In, in COO, if you have a, call, a row or a column that doesn't have any zeros, okay, one question is why should that be in your matrix in the first place? But in some cases, yes, you, you could run into a situation where one of your columns or rows have, all have zeros. In COO, uh, if you have a situation like that, uh, then you won't pay anything for that, right? Because COO will only store the non zero with those columns to row index. Uh, in CSR, if you have a row in the, a row with all zeros, you will still need to have an element for it inside of the row pointers array, uh, but you wouldn't have any values for it inside of the uh, the, uh, the, not the the values of the column index arrays. But we will see in some of these other formats, even if a row was uh, all zeros, we might still need to have some data allocated for it. So we'll we'll take a look at that. Next. Okay, thank you. Right. Yeah, you're welcome. Any other questions? Okay, if not, then you can read uh, more about what we covered today in chapter 10 of the textbook, uh, particularly these sections. And that's all for today, and I will see you next time. Bye, everyone.